Hello. I don't know if you've noticed at this point, but I like to read. Comes up in conversation a lot with people. You know, what do you do for fun? I tell people I like to read. Inevitably, the following question is what kind of thing do you like to read? And it can be hard to answer that because the true answer is smut. I mostly like to read smut, but that's not really like an appropriate party answer. So I tell people I like to read romance and fantasy and sometimes fantasy romance. And without fail, almost every single time, somebody says, have you ever read Brandon Sanderson? And the answer up to now has been no, I have not. I'm intimidated. I'm terrified, honestly. That man writes the longest books. In fact, I've got multiple good friends who are huge Brandon Sanderson fans, and they've been unionizing at this point. They're pounding down my door. They have pitchforks. They've got signs. Justice for the Brandon Sanderson fans in your friend group. We deserve rights, and those rights are apparently you reading our favorite author. <laughs> They're begging me. They're begging me. They're watching this like we were not begging you. We asked like twice, <laughs> but that feels like begging to me, okay? So then, of course, the natural next question is, well, which one should I start with? And everybody said... The Mistborn Saga. Like it's shorter, the world building is less intense, it'll give you an idea of his writing without you having to invest in like a 1200 page book. And I said, right, right, cool. Right, I'm gonna read The Way of Kings. <laughs> and thar she blows. She's a thick one. I read through the second part. I thought we could just sit and talk through it up to now. And when I read the third part, I'll do another update. And then when I read the fourth part, I'll do another update. How's that sound? So I'm about halfway through page five. Can we do away with not having page numbers on the intro page to a chapter? Why? Why don't we have a page number there? One would argue that's the most important place to have a page number. That's where the table of contents points someone to. I'm on page 565, that's halfway through the book. So she's, she's long, okay? I will be talking about the plot in depth. So if you don't want spoilers, this isn't going to be the video for you. I'm so sorry. The blurb on the back says, should I just read it to you? Should we do some group reading? I long for the days before the last... Oh my goodness. Give me a second. I long for the days before the last desolation, before the heralds abandoned us and the night's radiant turned against us, when there was still magic in Roshar and honor in the hearts of men. In the end... Not war, but victory proved the greater test. Did our foes see that the harder they fought, the fiercer our resistance? Fire and hammer forged a sword. Time and neglect rusted away. So we won the world, yet lost it. Now there are four whom we watch. The surgeon, forced to forsake healing and fight in the most brutal war of our time. The assassin, who weaves as he kills. The liar, who wears her scholar's mantle over a thief's heart. And the prince, whose eyes open to the ancient past as his thirst for battle wanes. One of them may redeem us. One of them will destroy us. From Brandon Sanderson, the author who completed Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time series, comes the Stormlight Archive, a richly imagined epic set in a world relentlessly blasted by awesome temptus, where emotions take on physical form and terrible secrets hide deep within the rocky landscape. Speak again, the hollow dose, life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination, the night's radiant must stand again. That is a lot. Even the back of the book is long. Like, my goodness. Me and Stanley have one quick editor's note for you. I am not going to be... Oh, he's mad at me for starting to talk. I tell you, they don't like it when I, like, talk. I'm not allowed to talk in my own home. I'm not going to be summarizing the world building, like, all of it. Assumption is that if you're watching this, you've probably read this book and you like it a lot and you want to watch me experience it. So you probably don't need a recap of, like, all the world building. As I'm about to tell you, there's about 300 pages of world building before any plot happens. So if I tried to summarize all of that... Well, I'll just tell you, the rough cut of this video was over two hours. And cutting that part out was a significant chunk of how I got it down to how long it is now. You know that I recognize that there's significantly more world building than what I'm about to talk about. I only left in the parts where I'm talking about something where I actually had something to say about it beyond just saying he added this and I thought it was cool if that makes sense. Because a lot of it's really cool and I thought a lot of it was cool and just because I don't mention it didn't mean I didn't think it was cool. It's just because I don't think anybody wants to watch me recap his world building for like 20 minutes. So I'm only going to mention it if I have something specific to say. Also, I'm about to be wrong a lot, but I thought it was fun. I don't know. I could have cut all the parts where I said like, I think this is going to happen and then I ended up being wrong or when I like said the wrong thing related to something else. But that's half the fun of watching someone experience a new book is like seeing how my mind changed as I went. I understand that a lot of the stuff I'm saying in the beginning does not end up being correct at the end. 
bear with me okay part one how do we feel one of the hardest things about reading this book thus far has been having so many friends who want like updates and stuff because the first part is basically all world building it's like i don't really have much to say like i've just been learning about the world like it's all set up the first 300 pages are all set up so i can say right off the bat if you are not someone who loves like a rich and luscious world in a fantasy novel you're not gonna like this you have to get through way too much world building before plot really starts for it to really be worth it if you're not gonna be there for the world building however said world building incredible one of the things i've been impressed with is the fact that he seems to have deliberately decided to not use any typical fantasy tropes so there are a lot of different like creatures and races of pe- i don't know if you like like versions of people like what would you call an elf that's not like a race of human at least up to now it seems that he's made almost the active decision to not do that like everything's invented from scratch it's cool to see the things that he's changed about the way people work almost or the way like humans work where with hair color you have like multiple different hair colors and you can have like streaks of different hair colors and it has to do with like purity of bloodline same with your eyes like light eyes are the lords or whatever and then dark eyes are considered like lesser than light eyes so you've got your light eyes and your dark eyes and then you've got like the strips in the hair like i was saying almost kind of like mine i would imagine but natural mine's dyed obviously <laughs> so that's really cool i also love the way he does his creatures and i use the word love very carefully here i think it's very unique and creative basically all of his land creatures are crabs, crustaceans, like shrimpy kind of creatures. They all walk on land. You know, one of the other things that I'm learning about myself through reading this book is that I might have a fear of crustaceans. I've never really been a big fan of like shrimp or lobster or crab like as a dish. I've never really been drawn to eat it. I've never really understood why people thought it was such a delicacy. The few times I have eaten it, I've been kind of grossed out. I don't really like seafood in general and I was vegan for a long time. So I just kind of chalked it all up to that and didn't think much of it. And it wasn't until I was reading this that I was like, damn, I don't like crabs. I don't like, they have like pet, like crustacean-y things that they call axe hounds that are like dogs almost but they're like crab dogs it's like a, if a crab was your dog like a big like a big shrimp crab looking thing was your dog no and then they have these like big stone things they call the void bringers they don't actually exist in the timeline that like we're reading in i shouldn't say timeline like in the era that we're reading in they don't really actually exist and the way that i had imagined those creatures was like big stone things with like the easter island heads and i like my imagination better and i've just decided to stick with it once you read enough books you realize if you don't like an author's description you can just make up your own I don't, I don't like the crabs, so I don't want to imagine the crabs, and that's just how it is. <laughs> so I respect it. I get it. I also think it's really smart because it's taking a creature that we're all familiar with, so you know what they look like. We all know what a shrimp looks like, but we've never seen a shrimp really walking on land, and so it does feel foreign to us, but it is something we can easily imagine in picture. So it's very smart. I just personally hate it. I just would have rather that he pick literally any other animal to do that with. And I have actually just gotten to an area in the book where he seems to have designed it after our world. I'm kind of glad that I waited until now to do this because I feel like I can kind of see where he's coming from as to what he's done with like the magic. Would magic be the right word? Like the way that he handles things that don't really exist in our world, like beyond just the creatures. So there are these things called high storms. I'm bad with names. I'm so sorry if I screw up the name of something as I'm filming this. I'm doing my best. Okay, it's not my strong suit. Their money are these little like glass beads that have gemstones inside and the gemstones can be charged with what's called storm light by leaving them out in the storms. There's at least one character that can do magic using the storm light but there's also this device that you can wear and you can like wield it and it makes you a soul caster and it changes the property of whatever it is you're using it on so the really good soul casters can take basically anything and cast it to be anything else you can even soul cast food this is really fascinating to me because one of the things that a lot of fantasy authors recommend against is having some kind of be all end all thing like this because
because you end up in a situation where most of the characters problems could be solved by just using whatever one of these things luckily for us they're very very rare and the people who use them are rare so the high storms like charge the money with stormlight stormlight can be used for magic and most people need a really specific device to do it and we've so far met one character that does not need that device to do it and then there are these things called spren this is really interesting i've been trying to figure out how to describe the spren they're like these little almost like i imagine them as like droplets that appear around certain things some of them are based in emotions so there's like anger spren or like anticipation spren or like fear spren then it seems like there's like rot spren so some of it is related to like human emotion but some of it is more related to like things that happened out in the world there's wind spren too we actually have a character that is a wind spren that's neat as well we haven't really gotten to the place where that's like important other than the one wind spren that's like a character it's just really cool for the world building i think because then as you're reading it he can describe that like anticipation spren is building up around somebody and you know that person is like building anticipation or whatever but the reason i mentioned like the way that he's described everything is so there are these things called high storms and they always move i believe from east to west there are these like really vicious storms you don't want to be out in one you want to be sheltered from one it's a form of punishment to just be strung up in a high storm it's almost seen as certain death i think that he has kind of established that the high storms are why like the spren exist and the stormlight and all of that stuff like it all it all stems from the storms because there's an area where the storms don't really hit they visited and this is really cool these merchants come through and it's this first time that this girl who's apprenticing on under this merchant sees like this area where the high storms don't really hit and she talks about how weird it is that like the grass doesn't move and at first because I was thinking of my own perspective of the world I was thinking that she was standing on the grass and she was literally just standing on it and she was balancing like on top of the grass but then through her description she also finds out like about soil like I, I guess they don't have like soil in a lot of places in the world so she's like surprised by the fact that the grass doesn't like move so that you don't step on it like the grass itself doesn't get up and run around and she was saying that like it almost seems like this area of the world is like kind of stupid <laughs> for lack of a better word or like dead i think what he's hinting at there is that the high storms are what kind of infuse the world with this magic so you have the spren and maybe the grass moves around or whatever a lot of countries a lot of kingdoms i'm sure that will be relevant later as of now we're mostly following this like one kingdom a car i believe is how you say it but we've got the four characters described on the back right and those are kind of like the main main characters but there's a few others that we jump around to as well so we're not trapped in these characters minds we can sometimes jump to others the only character that we really get in depth in the first part is Shallon. She's the only one that I feel the need to talk about in isolation, I guess, because she's not in the second part at all. She is going to try and be the ward of the king's sister because she's this known scholar, heretic, that seems to be really important in the story. They bring it up a bunch, so I think eventually it'll be important that she's kind of a heretic. Everyone in the story is very religious. Everybody has like some kind of religion that they follow. It's called out about her a lot and brought up about her a lot that she is a heretic, that she doesn't believe in any of the one religion. So I have a feeling that's going to end up becoming important. But all of that to say that Shallon is a ward under the king's sister. I forget her name. She's the heretic. I don't know if I said that clearly. Shallon's not the heretic. She wants to go train under her, but really it's because she heard that she has this really powerful soul caster. And Shallon's house is in financial ruin. Her dad was not very good at managing the family finances. And then he died and she found out that the way that he was managing things was by soul casting things into marble and then claiming they were natural deposits. And so she is going to steal the soul caster from the king's sister and try and do the same thing. And that's really all that we see of her. And that's why I'm saying like most of those 300 pages were spent world building. Like we spent that entire time with her and she essentially successfully became Jesna. I think her name is Jez something like that. Jesna's ward. So I'm curious to see where that goes, but we don't really know that much even about her except the fact that she's from this house and she's typically very timid and that she's very, very good at drawing. We shall see how that story plays out. Then the other character we really follow in the first bit is Kaladin. Kaladin is, was originally this really amazing soldier who somehow got betrayed by his leader of his army and ended up being sold into slavery. And he found his way to being a bridgeman in Sidious's army. Sidious is one of the high princes 
consequences of a left car. They're in this constant war with these people called the Parshneti, Parshendi? I think it's actually Parshendi. They assassinated the Alephi king like six or seven years ago. If you're confused, welcome to the club. There's like a lot going on at all times in this book. The other two characters that we've met so far are the High Prince Dalinar and his son Adeline. When we're in the Dalinar Adelin perspective, we kind of jump between them and then we can follow Kaladin as well. And they're all kind of at this war camp. Kaladin is in Sidious's like army or he's not really in the army, he's a bridgeman. Dalinar and Adeline are like the high prince of a different army. All high princes that are like under a king. Does that make sense? And so they all have like their different lands and stuff. And so they all have a war camp at this like place and they're fighting these Parshendi because they killed their king or they say that's why. But really it's because they can collect these gem hearts from these big stone things that are kind of like mini void bringers it seems at this point. All of that to say. What about Kaladin? What is there to say? The Bridgman job seems really horrible. They're like they call it the shattered plane and they're like all these different plateaus that are separated by these giant chasms and the bridgemen have to run with a bridge and then when they get to where they're going they've built a bunch of permanent bridges across some of these plateaus but the bridgemen essentially run with not permanent bridges and use them over the chasms that they haven't built permanent bridges over and bridgemen just die in huge numbers because the Parshendi shoot a bunch of arrows at them as they're trying to put down the bridges and so like half their men die like every bridge battle it's this really gruesome thing that like a lot of the other high princes actually refuse to do Sidious is kind of the big bad right now he's our like main antagonist I guess you would say he's the high prince of that area so we hate him for two reasons we hate him because of what he's doing to Kaladin and all the bridgemen and we hate him because he's kind of dar targeting Dalinar and this is where I want to dive into my one major criticism of the book up to now all of these characters are very one way or another and I personally don't like that I am not a fan of characters that are like good to their core or evil to their core I just think it's boring so Kaladin was really like annoying to me for a while because he's very like down on himself when we first meet him and then he's got this windspren Syl who like follows him around and she kind of gets him like back up and going righteous and like I always try to do the right thing I always try to help people kind of person and then he got beaten down like over time and then he's kind of like come back up into one to help people perfect like super righteous guy i don't know i've just i've just find him so dull like i'm a fan of the bridge men as like a group i like the way they all interact with each other but kaladin is like my least favorite of the group i love rock i want to read more about rock he's awesome he's so fun he makes every scene he's in so fun and i feel like we're just missing that like kaladin almost like doesn't have a personality like his whole personality is wanting to be the savior and otherwise he just like doesn't really have much else to him and i feel very similarly about Sidious. Now we're never really inside of Sidious's head. I don't know if we're ever going to be inside of Sidious's head but up to now we have not been inside of his head but he's painted as this like super villain. So I think he's either going to end up turning out to be this like great guy and it, it all turns around in a way where you're like oh I guess he was trying to help the whole time or he's just the big bad and he's going to end up getting defeated but again it's just so boring. I'm at a point in my reading career where I want in-depth nuanced villains. Like I do not want to read someone who's just supposed to to be the villain and you're supposed to hate them and you're supposed to root for their downfall I want there to be a little bit more nuance to it than that at this point and so I'm a little bit like oh I hope there ends up being nuance and I hope that the nuance isn't just that we find out a piece of information that completely flips us to the side that he's a good person especially because of the way he treats the bridgeman I think that would be really hard to do and so I think if it does end up getting revealed that he is trying to do some good and we are supposed to root for him a little bit then that might lend itself to some of the nuance that I want to see where we hate him because of what he's doing to Kaladin but maybe we like him because of what he's doing to support the king and Dalinar. There's complications there where it's like, well, I want him to succeed in what he's doing for the king, but I also want Kaladin to murder him. I see the possibility for that. I don't know if that's going to end up happening. I, that's the direction I hope it heads. So we'll see. But I think it's actually significantly more likely that Kaladin ends up just killing him and taking the shard plate unfortunately. I'll be happy for Kaladin, but a little bit disappointed. Now, Dalinar and Adeline, now we're having some fun. Dalinar is the High Prince, Adeline is his son. People think he's going crazy. He started having these visions like during the high storms, and in the visions, he gets transported back to different eras in time to like watch different things go down, but he's not just watching. He actually like goes into somebody's body and like lives time with them. He keeps hearing this voice of someone saying to him, you have to unite them, unite them. Everstorm is coming 
coming you have to unite them and he thinks they're talking about the high princes he's really losing his taste for battle he's become obsessed with this book called the way of kings his brother was the king that got murdered and he felt like it was partially his fault because he was super drunk that night his brother was really into this book called the way of kings and these like knights codes and like all these things so he's gotten super into those things he's kind of lost his taste for battle really has lost respect for a lot of the people around him because like battling and war is like their whole culture right and then Adeline loves his dad and really sees how powerful his dad can be but is very frustrated with the turn that his dad has taken and like wishes for his dad to come back and be like the fearsome warmonger that he's been his whole life this is what I'm talking about this is what I'm asking for you've got this father and son that have a great relationship that clearly love each other dearly but they disapprove of each other's actions where the son wants the dad to be this warmonger and the dad wishes the son saw his point of view we don't know if the visions are real or not we don't know like even we the reader like we're led to believe that the visions are real but I think it would be a fun twist if they turned out not to be real we'll see if that actually happens I, I think most likely they are real <laughs> I think it would be just hysterical if it did turn out that he was going crazy <laughs> again complicated relationship between the father and son they love each other but they're trying to learn how to see eye to eye the father is wondering if he can trust the visions the son doesn't really trust the visions at all but he trusts his father the father's trying to figure out like how to move through it and how to deal with the king and all of that at the end of part two Dalinar decides that he is going to step down and hand the princedom to Adeline now I don't actually think that he is going to that was kind of the cliffhanger at the end of the part but I am pretty sure especially because on the back it calls him the prince I have a feeling that he's not going to end up stepping down like he's going to have decided to step down he's probably going to talk to Adeline about it and either Adeline's going to talk him out of it or the king's going to talk him out of it or something else is going to happen like before he can step down something crazy happens I don't think he's actually going to step down I guess we'll see if I'm wrong about that see that's what I want to see that's that's I'm I love them every time I get to their chapters I'm like so into what I'm reading and then I gotta flip back to Kaladin and I'm like oh he's so boring in my opinion he's a little bit boring I don't mean to be harsh but all of that to say I think there's very few authors who could have held me for 500 pages and he's been holding me sweetly you know he's been holding me I don't know what I'm fucking saying so those are kind of my gut thoughts up to now. I think the world is really, really cool. And I'm fascinated by the Dalinar and Adeline storyline. I'm a little bit less interested in Shallon and Kaladin. And then we have the interludes. Now the interludes are interesting because one of the characters in the interludes is the guy who killed the king. And he has these crazy magical powers. He's the one who can do magic with just Stormlight and he doesn't need a uh, soul caster. I'm not really sure why. They keep calling him a truthless and he's one of the Shin, which is like the people who are from the part of the world that's kind of like our world where we don't have like the Stormlight and stuff because they don't get the high storms. You remember when I was talking about that? He's from that part of the world, but he can use the Stormlight to do magic. So I find that fascinating because I don't know how they explain how they have Stormlight in that area. I'm sure we'll get there. He can do all this crazy magic and he's this thing called Truthless. He was the one who killed the king and he has this oath stone and whoever holds the oath stone is his master and he has to follow them. Very interestingly, it seems like it's a religion that he follows and he's just started to question the religion after all this time. That's very interesting to me. I'm excited to see where that goes. Someone also just became his master who has a full breadth of understanding of what he's capable of. And he openly says that this is like his worst fear. Like he does not believe in killing. He does not want to kill. But what a lot of people use him to do is kill. He was doing all of this like grunt work essentially for this gambling master, like casino owner guy. The new master wants him to kill six of the high princes. I don't know which six. Maybe that's what ends up happening. Happening that stops Dalinar from stepping down. Six high princes get murdered. I don't know. The king of another area. Seth is his name, but it's spelled with a Z, like S-Z-E-T-H is like very terrified about this he can't betray his oath apparently he has to do what this person wants but he's he doesn't want to and and see again this is like the nuance and the interest that i'm looking for like why what is his religion why does he believe in it so strongly that he knows that committing these actions are going to send the entire world into chaos and strife and that there's going to be war because of these actions but he's going to go do them anyway because he was instructed to by his master that has the oath stone so his religion is so strong that he's He's going to do these things that he actively not just doesn't want to do but knows is essentially going to destroy the world 
And yet part of his religion is that killing is wrong. And he keeps talking about like suffering and his soul in stone. Fascinating because the void bringers were these stone beings. And so I'm almost wondering if like they end up becoming void bringers. Wouldn't that be fun if like instead of ceasing, because he's like, it's better to live a life of suffering than to cease to exist. And so he's doing all of this so that his soul can be cast into stone. That's where I'm saying. I think I, I wonder if the truthless end up becoming the void bringers like once they die. I don't know. That's just speculation. I don't know if that's true or not but I'm curious to see if that ends up being the case fascinating like I'm loving both the little Seth we only get him in the interludes but I'm loving his interludes and I'm loving Dalinar and Adeline's their storyline because of how complicated it is the next part it tells you the names of who's in it on the front and we're only gonna get Kaladin and Shallan so <sighs> Dang it. Final wrap up thoughts for these two parts only. I think it's a testament to how good an author he is that I am still so invested and interested. I'm not really a big book person. I can read longer books, but I typically read shorter ones. So the fact that I'm 500 pages into the story and I still want to keep reading, I think is saying something. And as much as I'm kind of bemoaning Kaladin and Shallan and, and having to read them for a whole 300 pages before I can get back to the characters that I really feel drawn to, I still know I'm going to enjoy it. I'm still enjoying myself. My other big critique is that I feel like he has a tendency to tell you what's going on instead of showing you. So a lot of places in the writing he's just like and this is what this is and that's what that is but I almost feel like that's necessary for the depth of world building that he's doing. Rules exist in art for a reason and so it's important to understand why they exist but that doesn't mean it's not okay to break them and I do think that the way that he breaks them while personally to me it's like okay I'm just reading like a little blurb about what this is and that's not as fun as being introduced to it like within the narrative but I understand why he does it because there's just so much information it's like it's better to just get the information to the reader and make sure they understand what it is and so while you're reading someone's like train of thought they might have a section of the train of thought that's dedicated to explaining to you what something is it's fine I think it's fine I don't think it ruins the book I just think it's important to remember that like you can break rules in writing as long as you understand why they're there you know what situations it'll fit well in order to break them and I think these are this is one of the situations in which that's true and I will update you as we go good morning um getting ready for the day we're starting with some SBF since I forgot that last time I did a little get ready with me prove I wear it okay I just forgot that one time okay so we read up until the end of the third part last night and by we I mean I did I don't know what you read last night maybe you read up until the third part who knows but yeah so we're on page like 900 right now I have thoughts I have thoughts and feelings and emotions a lot has happened stuff has finally happened what to where we can like get into specifics of plot but that in and of itself is telling me something also I'm using the viewfinder so sorry I'm not looking right at the camera viewfinder <laughs> why am I pretending like I have a real camera I'm using the screen of my phone to do my makeup finally kind of getting to the part where things are happening things are happening and they're happening quickly I have mixed feelings about that because I feel like it took us so so long to get to the part where stuff is like happening I think like whether or not I would recommend this book to somebody it was really really dependent on like why you read and what you enjoy about a book because if you really find joy in like completing books and checking them off your list this is not going to be the book for you there was a point I think it was around page like 500 five or 600 where I was really struggling to continue and I've got to be honest like if I didn't have so many friends who loved this book I probably wouldn't have finished it even though I've been filming this video I honestly probably would have abandoned the video or maybe I would have completed the video and just said I was giving up on the book but I have so many friends that are so obsessed with this series like and it feels like every time I bring it up to someone I find a new friend who's obsessed with the series so many people love it so much that I was like, you know what, I'm going to finish this first one at the very least. It's so slow. <laughs> it's so slow for so long. And it, especially filming the video almost like exacerbated that, I feel like, because I'd sit down to film these inserts and I'd be like, what am I even going to say? There's been world building, Kaladin's still a bridgeman, Shalon is her name apparently, a friend has informed me. Shalon has just been a ward looking to like steal this thing for so long. Adeline and Dalinar were like the reason I was still reading and when I got into the part where it was just back to Kaladin and Shalon, I was like I, I literally don't want to keep going. Like I'm not interested enough in their stories and I still feel like Kaladin's especially has been so predictable. Shalon 
not so much. Like, some of she... I guess I'm doing full spoiler, so I'll just tell you. I was very surprised when whatever that Arden's name is, I forget, starts with a K. But when he tried to kill her, that did that did get me. I was not expecting that, so I will give him that. That that was quite alarming, I will say. But also I'm like kind of bummed because her relationship with Jasna was so interesting. So I'm hoping they like reconcile in some way and that that's not like the end of them hanging out I don't know but I will say that that did surprise me right so it's not all it hasn't all been like super predictable but Kaladin's story specifically I just feel like that I predicted that he was going to get strung up in the high storm and survive it has turned but I still feel like I'm not going to turn the page and be surprised I genuinely feel like without Adeline and Dalinar and like the promise of getting back to them and reading their story I probably would have like nothing I was looking forward to and would just be like forcing my way through maybe and this is just speculation like I don't know this for sure does it kind of look like I have a black eye I might have just given myself a makeup black eye anyway feel like it's very difficult to write books that have multiple characters going on at the same time without them ending up being super long because you kind of oh my goodness kind of end up end up having like a book's worth of content for each character but I don't feel like we needed that like I just don't feel like I guess this is my frustration is I don't feel like we needed like all of this time with the book in order to get to where we've gotten to with the characters like I feel like there was a lot of fluff and we could have cut out a lot of the fluff and gotten here like a lot quicker just because I'm saying I feel like we could have done that doesn't mean I'm saying that like we should have done that and by we I mean Brandon Sanderson hang on I'm gonna tight line I'm not gonna make you guys watch me do this give me two seconds okay anyway I just feel like we didn't need all of this detail into Kaladin and Shallan specifically. Like, I feel like with Adeline and Dalinar, there hasn't really been a wasted scene yet. All of them have really taught us something. Like, even the feast scene, like, that showed us how Dalinar- This isn't- brush is not working for what I'm trying to do. Even that feast scene shows us how Dalinar has been kind of, like, ostracized from the rest of the people and introduces, uh, what's her name? The- the king's, like, widow introduced us to her and we needed to meet her you know so like I I just feel like with Adelar Adelar I just combined them into one person with Dalinar and Adeline like there hasn't really been a wasted scene but I feel like for some of the scenes with like Kaladin and Shallan I just feel like I didn't learn anything new so then it becomes really frustrating and so I feel like he either wanted to have a book's worth of content for each character then if you separate them out into their own books like they wouldn't have been enough for someone to read them like it, it's it's the connection of all of them together that makes it more interesting to read <laughs> what a stupid point i just made oh shit it would have been bad if he did this but he didn't do that so great points meredith great analysis but my point being that like even kaladin and shallan by themselves probably would not have been enough to hold my attention like I kind of needed the stuff with Dalinar and Adeline in order to be like still interested and invested in the story and I'm excited that this next part seems really focused on them and now we're gonna get some stuff from the King's Widow's perspective too I'm excited about that and don't get me wrong like I'm still invested in the story like I'm still reading it and I love my friends but only so much like if I was that bored I would not still be pushing through but also understand that like all of this that I'm saying does not necessarily mean that like this book is bad or that I wouldn't recommend it to people or obviously I think Brandon Sanderson is an amazing author I just think like different people have different tastes and for me it's really challenging to read like really really slow burns like I can read long books as long as they're like action-packed the way that the magic is like explained like he's clearly put a lot of thought into how everything in this world connects together the magic like why the world is different from our world like how the magic works and I am now very very interested now that I've kind of put the connection there that Kaladin's powers and Seth's powers might be very similar. Kaladin has the potential to become a warrior like Seth. And I want, I've said this in every insert, but I want to know more about Seth. I want to understand more about like where he comes from, like what are the truthless. And so I have a feeling like if Kaladin is similar to Seth, I feel like in the next book he, we're going to see that. Like we're going to see him becoming truthless or at least being trained, like maybe not becoming a full truthless like Seth. 
you know, seeing him become, like, like be trained the way that Seth was to be able to do a lot of what Seth does, I think is really cool. And also explains why we were just getting these inserts of this guy instead of getting more information. Because I, I, this whole time I've been like, show me more of Seth. I want to understand more about this truthless thing. Like, that is so interesting. Why am I watching this guy be a bridgeman for like 500 pages? I want to know more about this dude who can tie himself to the ceiling with magic. Like, that's cool. And is this like insane warrior? Like, I want to know more about him. Stop telling me about this other guy, you know? But then it's like, if the other guy is going to become like that guy, okay, fine. But I just think from a personal preference thing, it's just like a lot of detail that is not like my thing, I guess. I also still have like 300 pages left, so none of these opinions are set in stone because according to my friend, like everything happens at the end. So for all I know, everything gets tied together beautifully and the ending of the book is just like, like so smart and I'm gonna be like, this is the best book ever written. He tied everything together so nicely and it, and all of that detail like was used because it's entirely possible that some of the detail that we've gotten like feels useless now because it hasn't been used yet. It will eventually get used and so it's not like forever gonna be useless, I guess. But I am holding my judgment on that until I get there. Like him turning down the shard plate does make him slightly more interesting to me because we've finally gotten like nuance with Kaladin. Like there was no nuance with him before. It was like he either was like gung ho, like super soldier, like I'm gonna help these men, or he's like down in the dumps, depressed, some might say. There wasn't any nuance there. It was like he either flip flopped between one or the other. And I will say that finding out that in the past, they had foreshadowed pretty heavily that he probably had won a shard plate at some point and been betrayed, but it did surprise me that he chose not to have it. Like he didn't want the shard plate when it was being offered to him. And I thought that was really interesting because not because like obviously in the moment you're like, no, take the shard blade. Like you have no idea what's about to happen to you. Like take the shard blade and you know it's in the past so you can't change what he does. But I do think that that adds like a layer of nuance to him because I think there's going to be a point in the future where he's offered shard plate again. And he's again going to have to face that question of like, should I take this? Can I use it for good? Or will it corrupt me the way it's corrupted everybody else? And will I become just like the other shard bearers? I don't know. I think that's interesting. I'm finally like interested in him. The other thing that I've kind of caught is, and I don't know if he's doing this on purpose, and we'll see if this ends up going anywhere. I think this will be more of a broader series thing than a just this book thing. But I think it's really interesting that right before we got the next insert with Seth, we started to talk a lot about like balance. I had a theory, I can't remember if I said this before, that the Parshendi are all about balance and that that's why they decided to kill the Alethi king because the Alethkar was like getting too powerful as a kingdom and so they basically trapped Alethkar in this like constant war with them to try and kind of like weaken them a little bit so they can't take over the world. I have a new theory too that the Parshmen aren't really all that different from the Parshendi and maybe they've kind of been sent out to help with this mission or they are different because there was a comment of like where's their music so maybe there is something that's different about them but the Parshendi are able to like rescue the Parshmen. I, I don't know. I will see how that turns out. That's interesting to me as well. I do think it's very fascinating that we've gotten a lot more of a breakdown of this religion that has to do with the almighty i forget what the religion's actually called boy Vor voranism or something like that voranism shalon had a lot of questions for the priest guy that tried to kill her eventually like what the what the void bringers are where they came from and like why the almighty would allow such a thing to exist and the ardent had something really interesting where he said it's the balance like how the almighty is the ultimate goodness the void bringers are like the ultimate evil that like there has to be that balance so like if you have something as good as the almighty you have to have something as evil as the void bringers and so i'm very fascinated by the fact that at the end of the little insert that we got with seth where he murdered essentially an entire room full of people and then killed the king. And he doesn't have a choice and he doesn't really want to do it. Or he claims he doesn't have a choice. We don't know why. But he hates himself and he doesn't want to be doing it. But he does it anyway. He kills this whole room full of people. And at the end, the king asks him who he is. And he says death. And then he kills the king. If it's building up to where Kaladin is like equal a warrior to Seth, then there's an argument that Kaladin becomes life. Which 
also is interesting and cool. And so we'll see if it ends up heading that direction. I'm not really sure. We shall see. We'll see how these last 300 pages go. Check back in at the end of it all. Hello. We are standing today. I'm not really sure why. I just feel like it. I have a lot of energy. A lot of energy. Finished the book last night. I have a lot to say. So I'm giving myself the room to move. You know what I'm saying? What am I doing? Okay. Finished The Way at Kings last night. I am superior. I will accept my award at any time. But I have a lot of thoughts. Like too many thoughts, I would think. There's just so much that actually happened right at the end. The whole book is like such a slow burn. And then right at the end, everything happens everywhere all at once. Genuinely within a span of like 50 pages. So what did I think? What are my what are my wrap up thoughts? Well, we're going to do a quick spoiler free section for anybody who skipped right to this part because they want to be able to see what I thought, but maybe they want to read the book. They haven't read it yet. This section's for you. What did I think? It's really good. I gave it a four. I'll tell you why I gave it a four. Four out of five, not four out of 10. Okay, four out of five, right? Think eight out of 10. That's how math works. The reason I gave it a four is just because of the length. And I will dive into it a little bit more in the spoiler section, but I do feel like there are parts that could have been condensed. Like I'm fine with length as long as I feel like that length is really being used. And there were points where I felt like we really could have condensed down what we were doing. That's why it's not a five for me. But as far as the actual book goes, I have almost no notes. Like the plot of the book, the characters, all of that stuff, I enjoyed it a ton. I think it would have been a five stars for me if it had been consolidated just a little bit. And so my recommendation for people who would read this, if you like epic fantasy, if you like world building, if you like slow burns, if you're cool reading like a lot of book where not a lot of plot necessarily happens, and it's more introducing you to the world, world and the characters, political intrigue, you would really, really like this. If you are somebody who needs a lot of plot, who needs a lot of action to carry you through a book, I don't think you would like this. There's not a lot of action at the beginning. It takes a bit for it to pick up. That's great. That's cool, right? Like people have different preferences. I'm not saying that that's bad, but it is just kind of a fact about it. I still, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. The thing that becomes really tough for me about it, truthfully, that style of book isn't really my taste. Now I do we weed. <laughs> I do read like a wide repertoire of books. I like all kinds of different things and I can enjoy almost anything. One of the things that's hardest for me to enjoy is a slow burn because I have a little thing called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I don't know if you're aware of it or if you've noticed. Long-term payoff is not exactly something that we're known for being able to handle well. You know what I'm saying? And so for me, it is sometimes very hard, especially with very long books like this, to read them where it's like you get this big payoff at the end. So I genuinely believe that if it wasn't for the number of friends and the closeness to which those friends are to me, what? This sentence isn't going to make sense, but you know what I'm saying. I love this book. Like I have so many dear friends who love this book that I was interacting with the whole time I was reading it. That made it super fun. That made it one of my favorite reading experiences in a long time. It's like every time I saw various different people, they were like, what part are you at? What's happening? What are your thoughts? How do you feel? And then watching everybody try to navigate how to talk to me about the book without spoiling anything, that was really funny too. I enjoyed that a lot, but I genuinely think without that, I never would have finished the book and I would have abandoned this video because it's just not my style. That being said, I'm glad I made it to the end because I feel like the end actually did have a massive payoff. Like it was somewhat worth it. And so that's what keeps it at a four. Brandon Sanderson has like some of the most intense and devoted fans of any author that I've seen. There's a reason reason for that. The book is really good and it does hold your attention. Like as much as I'm saying I don't know that I would have finished it without my friends, it's because I have ADHD. Like I do think that a normal person that can focus easily would have an easy time making it through this book because there was enough to carry you forward. I had enough questions. I think he did something that I think is really smart if you're writing your own books and you know it's going to be a series and you have kind of this question of like how do I make the ending feel satisfying? 
satisfying without stopping the reader from wanting to continue the series I think is the best route is to essentially answer all the questions that you opened in that book but then open some new questions that the reader can then carry to the next book so most of their questions that they had as they were reading the book are answered but now I have new questions because of the answers to those questions I very much felt like the ending was like that you got the answer to everything you wanted to know now because of the information that you got in the answers to those questions there's new questions to encourage you to go out and buy the second book now I thought that I would read a few other books in between this and that one in my fun stack because this was just so intense and I might still but I will tell you that I'm gonna go out today and buy the second one and I probably will start it tonight whether or not I read it all the way through without reading another book the way I did this one I'm not sure I really pushed myself to do that because I wanted to get this video out and like I said my friends were kind of on my butt about finishing the book I think for the next ones I probably won't make video maybe I'll make like wrap-up videos on them but I won't make video like as I'm going and I might like read other books in tandem with it just something a little lighter and fluffier for when I'm really tired and I want to read but I don't want to think as hard as I have to when I'm reading this series what are my spoiler free thoughts um, I'm about to dive into spoilers and when I say I'm about to dive into spoilers these are some real spoilers so this is your last warning if you don't want the ending of the book spoiled thank you so much I will see you in the next one I appreciate you have a great day all right now that the riffraff is gone, let's get into it for real. I don't even know where to begin talking about all the shit that happened in the last like two, three hundred pages. The last update I gave, pretty sure I still had like 500 pages left, was a thick part. The last part, if you will, is only like 50 pages. So you end up just kind of powering through. And then there's an epilogue. And you're like, are you serious, dude? I just read all this and you're going to give me an epilogue too? But like, okay. Technically, this is only the updates for part four and five. And part five is much shorter than part four. But everything happens in part five pretty much so where to even begin let's go overall first I did think it was a little too long when I say too long again I'll stress I don't think it's bad for a book to be long but I think if it's gonna be long I think you have to fill out a lot of that space when you aren't limiting yourself to how long the book is gonna be you can sometimes fall into a bit of a repetitive trap because you're not cutting for length you don't end up cutting some stuff that you maybe otherwise would have and consolidating I think there's a middle ground I think you can be okay with the fact that your book is gonna be really long but still make sure that every scene really has a purpose and there were points where even looking back on it now that I've read the ending I didn't really feel like every scene had a purpose specifically with Shalon and Kaladin I thought had like a lot of fluff and I thought that was interesting because their stories are so so much longer than Dalinar and Adeline's we spend so much more time with them than we do with Dalinar and Adeline so much of that time is fluff in my opinion a lot of the early stuff with Shalon and her wardship and arriving at the city all of that I just didn't feel like a lot of it was necessary I understand showing that she tried many times to become Jasna's ward so I, I get it from that perspective just feel like it could have been summarized better but then when they get into the studying especially it's just so much of her studying and I can get it from the perspective of like if you want the reader to know that information but I just it was too many scenes like that there reaches a point where even if that is a really great way to drive that idea right even if that's a really great way to expose the reader to some of this information reaches a point where it's too much in my opinion and you've got to find another way to also deliver that exposition to the reader because there's only so many scenes I want to read of Shalon sitting in the veil or I think that's what that was called room where it's like really dark and everybody has their own alcoves and she's like reading books and she's drawing things like there's only so many scenes we can get of that exactly before they all start to bleed together and the question you really have to ask yourself I guess is how much of this information is the reader even really going to hold in their head and there's a middle ground there too because it's still good to in introduce the information even if you don't have the expectation that the reader is going to remember it but some of the stuff that we learned about Shalon's family like at the beginning of this first story I guess like I'm not going to remember it at all and so when it comes back up in the next books as I assume it's going to because he doesn't 
really seem to waste any information that he has given you. So I assume this is going to come back up, but I'm not going to remember by then. And he's going to have to retell me all this history about her story or at the very least remind me of it. And so what was the point in me reading it then when I could have just been introduced to that stuff later on? I understand introducing her dad because of the plot twist we get at the end that her dad is a part of this organization that seems to be trying to learn more information about the Voidbringers and how to soul cast and all that kind of stuff. I understand like talking about her dad and also all the foreshadowing that she was the one who killed her dad. But again, it was so repetitive. Like we got so much of that that it's like, I just don't think we needed it. I think we could have cut it down to a lot fewer scenes and learned the same amount of information about Shalon specifically. And then I think we could have tried to introduce if there's information about the world that Brandon Sanderson wanted us to have. I think we needed, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what this is. But I think whatever this is, this is a better way to do it, apparently. <laughs> it's interspersing it a little bit more instead of relying on Shalon and her research to be the driver for a lot of some of the world building we're learning. And with Kaladin, I felt very similar in that so much of his time as a bridgeman felt the exact same. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating what felt like 10 of his chapters in a row that basically followed the same structure, which is Kaladin thinking to himself, I've really got to save these bridgemen. I've got to figure out a way to save these bridgemen and then training them to to do something soldier related and then something bad happening like because the people in Sidious's camp like don't want the bridgemen to have rights they're really determined and dead set on abusing these bridgemen and so then they come in and they do something to them and then Kaladin's like oh what are we going to do about that and then the next scene starts and the next scene essentially starts with Kaladin figuring out a way around whatever limitation was put on them before. And then essentially the exact same scene happens where another limitation is put on them. And at the end of the scene, Kaladin's like, oh, what are we to do as a bridgeman? And like the start of the next scene is him solving that problem. And we were on that cycle just over and over again. We spent so much time with them in the chasms, collecting stuff. We spent so much time with them training. I just didn't think it was necessary. Like when you talk about how long this book is. I feel like so many of those scenes could have been consolidated. And when I was thinking about it, I think one of the justifications I could come up with as to why he did that, he being Brandon Sanderson, is because we also had to see a lot of time of Kaladin as a youth, and he probably doesn't want us to think of Kaladin as a child. And so we have to spend more time with adult Kaladin than we do with young Kaladin. But even that being said, I felt like a lot of the stories from his youth also could have been condensed. Like really what we needed to learn from there was was that Kaladin was raised by a very honorable man. His dad was very, very honorable and their family was very full of love and that losing them, in a sense, was very hard for Kaladin. His brother's dead and he feels like he can't return to his parents because his brother's dead. I do hope that he eventually does. I get why we saw his family and I get why we spent time with him when he was young, but I do wish that, again, it had just been condensed. Like, I feel like a lot of those scenes could have been combined where you're not necessarily seeing all those scenes just in one chapter that's not what I mean I mean the information we were being given about Kaladin and the Bridgman and young Kaladin and his family like that you could take what you're trying to tell the reader in all those scenes and combine them into significantly less scenes as a result that's what kind of hurt it for me in the rating not that four is a bad rating I mean that's still like a really good rating it would have been a five stars because of how good the ending was if I felt like all the time in the middle was used adequately and in my opinion, I just didn't feel like he filled those chapters out as much as I would have preferred. But again, that's just an opinion. You can totally disagree with me. A lot of people really just love reading world building and political intrigue. And so that like aspect of the story is very interesting to them. For me, I find characters and the actions of those characters to be very interesting and their relationships between others. And so the fact that that seemed to be the repetitive part and like we just saw Kaladin's relationship with his dad like over and over and over again, but it was the same interaction where like, Kaladin's dad is like this is the honorable thing to do and Kaladin was like why that's so stupid and his dad was like it, we must be honorable men and it's like they're having basically the same conversation like 20 times when you flash back to Kaladin's youth then Kaladin bonding with the Bridgman again the interactions are so similar every time and Shalon interacting with the Arden and interacting with Jasna like those interactions being so similar every time like I think that's why it wore on me because that's a lot of what motivates me through a book the political stuff was cool but I don't necessarily care about it as much as I care about the relationships between the characters I'm reading about as opposed to like the countries and their wars. You see what I'm saying? So it's a personal preference thing. Doesn't
doesn't make it a bad book just makes it maybe not like my ideal fantasy now you might have noticed that I didn't really talk about Dalinar and Adelin at all I don't feel like anything I just said applied to their storyline <laughs> whatever Brandon Sanderson did with them I feel like he should have applied more of to Shallan and Kaladin's storylines I didn't really feel like the Dalinar and Adelin parts were repetitive like we saw a relationship between a father and his son who have the pressures of running a kingdom on their shoulder and are seemingly very honorable men very much mirrors I think the relationship between Kaladin and his father there was kind of a point where it said that Dalinar was being kind of paternal towards Kaladin at the end and I think there's something there I think Kaladin is going to kind of like surrogate into Dalinar's family and that Dalinar will almost take the place of Kaladin's father in his life and help give him guidance I think we're supposed to see that parallel between Dalinar and Adeline and Kaladin's dad and Kaladin Th their interactions are somewhat similar but there was more interest in it for me because I felt like every conversation did have a slightly different feel to it with Kaladin and his dad so much of the time with them like I said it was the same interaction over and over again right like why are we doing this dad because it's the honorable thing well but it would be so much easier for us if we did it this way but this way is the honorable way like that was their whole shtick whereas with Adeline and Dalinar it felt like the conversation changed slightly every time they had it because Adeline was like learning from his father and he was growing more and more to see his father's perspective and gaining more and more respect for his father not that he disrespected his father at the beginning but just understanding more and more about why his father feels the way he does about certain things and so every time they had the conversation it had a slightly different flavor and it actually did feel like an adult son and his dad coming to an agreement and like coming to a middle ground and learning to understand each other under all these pressures and I thought that was really beautiful like that in and of itself was so gorgeous for me to read I enjoyed it so so much the only criticism I really have for their storyline is that I, I you know there's no stakes for them in the battles and that's fine if you want to show that they're essentially these unbreakable warriors do that but just don't make the battle scenes as long I guess very similarly to the rest of it it's like okay that's cool then just establish that and move on instead of you know I read like a chapter long battle in which the whole time you were never at all worried about Dalinar or Adeline because they're such good fighters and they have the shard plate and the shard blades that being said everything I just s criticized about the battles it completely doesn't apply to the very last battle they did I thought he was gonna pull a George R.R. R. Martin I won't say why I'm making that reference in case you haven't read the first Game of Thrones but I really thought he was gonna go there and I thought that Adeline was gonna be the only one one who survived that battle and especially because Kaladin is the one who convinces Adeline to like retreat I thought it would lead us to a really fascinating conundrum there in the next book where Adeline is maybe a little bit angry at Kaladin because he forced him to retreat but also understands that Kaladin probably saved his life and he probably wouldn't have survived if he didn't but then he feels guilt over his dad's death but then he and Kaladin still kind of bond like I thought it would open us up for something interesting but obviously I would have really missed Dalinar and so I'm happy that Dalinar did end up surviving but I will say there were stakes there like I thought it was believable enough that Dalinar actually passed in that battle which made it a very intense read which is really good especially because we've made him so invincible up to this point there's something very fun about the shard plate because the shard plate makes you essentially invincible until it breaks down itself like it breaks down over time and the thing that becomes fascinating about it is that this thing that made you so invincible through so much of the battle becomes comes your weakness once it's broken down once your enemy really breaks down the shard plate it becomes very heavy and it almost like weighs down the wearer so they're having a lot harder time fighting than they would have if they weren't wearing it at all I think the shard plate is meant to represent the human beings and the way that they've lived their lives over the course of that earth Roshar I think they call the planet because part of what makes human beings so strong and so resilient is our connections to each other and our desire to survive and our desire desire to better our own lives and make things more convenient for ourselves and our desire to invent things all of these things are part of why human beings are essentially the apex predators of the entire planet that same desire to survive and to make our lives better is a lot of what leads to like 
colonization and war you know the way I live my life is better than the way you live your life and I'm gonna come over take your people and take all your resources so I can make my people's lives better our desire to help each other like those in our community and our desire to better everyone in our community's lives is part of what drives war and I thought a lot of that was also conquered in the battle scenes like we see both Kaladin and Dalinar struggling with how much of the Parshendi they have to kill and feeling guilt over those lives but then simultaneously understanding that if they were not doing the killing they would be being killed by these people and so there's the both of them carry this guilt in this war is the war necessary do we really need to be here would they still be targeting us and killing us if we weren't here in the shattered plains going after these gem hearts so you can see how I think that parallels the shard plate itself like this thing that's used in war that is such an advantage until it's not and once it's not an advantage it destroys the wearer it's part of what drags them down same with humans and so I think all of that like the whole war scenes and all of those I think are supposed to kind of represent that still feel like there were too many of them and they were too long but I do appreciate the messaging that we got there I just feel like it could have been delivered in less pages we'll focus on Kaladin for a bit and then I'll dive into all the craziness that happened at the end Kaladin's story I already kind of talked about it felt was kind of repetitive and the other downside that Kaladin really had is that he is on just the most classic like traditional hero's journey that there is and so very little that happened with Kaladin specifically surprised me. I think the only prediction that I had that did not come to fruition was that I thought he was going to end up defeating Sidious and taking his shard plate. And that, buddy, that could still happen. That could happen in the next book. So maybe it is still going to happen. Who knows? But other than that, I just felt like Kaladin's next like three to five moves on the chessboard were so predictable. And so I liked him a lot. And I love Syl. Syl is like one of my favorite characters. I think she's so fun. And the fact that it was like Syl and Kaladin's bond that gave him the power, I think is super duper fun. I think that's going to lead us or that opens us up to in the next books having a lot of messaging about connecting with nature because so much of the spren are related to like nature and the world. I think what he's setting up is showing that it's the connection between the humans and Roshar, their planet, that gives them the strength to be these superhuman beings and so we need to embrace more of nature. I think we're going to get a little bit of that as we move forward. So I really appreciated that and I loved Syl. I thought she was cute. I thought she was fun. I thought she enhanced the Kaladin scenes a lot. As much as I feel like they could have been cut down, I liked him. I was rooting for him. And even though I knew what he was going to do, I was still rooting for it to happen anyway. I, I'm going to I'm gonna beat this point to the ground, but I just really think if it had been shorter, it would have been fine. And with that, let's dive into the events that did happen. Because right at the end, we learned a crazy amount of shit and I have thoughts and feelings. These are in no particular order because I was way too lazy to write them down in order. Jasna's soul casting. So we find out at the end that Jasna's soul caster is fake. Same that Shallan's soul caster was fake. And yet they both were able to soul cast. Why is that? Well, the Ardent that Shallan has been bonding with tries to kill her. Jasna saves her life, but she had already soul casted before she did. And so that's how Shallan figures out that it has nothing to do with the soul casters themselves. Jasna is just doing it by herself. And that's why she didn't notice that Shallan had swapped them because hers was also a fake. And we find out that Shallan has the same abilities that Jasna does because she also soul casted at one point. She knows that she's able to soul cast without the soul caster thing. And as far as they know, they're the only two people who can do that. I'm curious curious to see if those powers are the same that all the Knights Radiant have. All of them can learn how to do all these things or if some of the Knights Radiant are going to be good at soul casting whereas some of the Knights Radiant are going to be good at you know the fighting. I don't know I'm curious. I'm gonna read the next book so I guess I'll find out. But yeah I thought that was a cool twist. I thought it was a good red herring because I thought the twist was going to be that Shallan's soul caster had worked the whole time and I thought what was going to happen was that she was going to switch hers and Jasna's and then Jasna's was going to work. One that she had that Shallan had switched out was going to work and then Shallan was going to be like, oh, I guess my soul caster worked the whole time. But hey, I like being a scholar, so I kind of want to still be a scholar, you know. <laughs> that was going to be the end of it. Finding out that Jasna didn't even need the soul caster to soul cast, I did not see coming, but it didn't feel like a cheap twist. It was close enough to what you expected, but still surprising. Very well executed. Controversial opinion, Brandon Sanderson's a good author and he kind of knows what he's doing. The twist that Shallan's dad is a part of this like other mysterious force is also looking into the Parshendi and all that, I thought was really fun. I did not see that coming at all, but again, it didn't feel 
cheap. That was one of those plot twists that I felt like I should have been able to predict and I didn't. So that's how you know it was executed well because it wasn't too obvious. I'm sure some people reading it did kind of figure that out. The other thing we learn from Jasna and Shalon in this one scene, it's one scene where we learn all three of these things. That Jasna can soul cast without the soul caster. That Shalon's dad was part of this secret organization and that the Parshendi are the void bringers or i guess the parshmen are the void bringers and that the parshendi are maybe the current iteration of the void bringers that is so fun and so smart and very similar to what i was saying about there almost being this red herring that you feel like shalon soulcaster is going to end up working but then you just find out that they don't need them at all i feel like the parshendi are very similar in that i thought the chasm fiends were going to end up being the void bringers i think they're going to turn out to be tools of the parshendis and that they can kind of control them and use them in their battles the parshendi themselves are the void bringers they're very dormant the parchment i don't think i've talked about them at all but they're almost servants trusted to do whatever you tell them to do and the things that i had kind of seen coming was that there was some relationship between the parchment and the parshendi that's pretty obvious right because they are the same kind of creature if you will the parshendi were going to be like the controllers almost like the puppet masters and that all the parchment worldwide were going to be able to be controlled by the parshendi and so there was going to be this uprising like with the parshendi right and so that's why I'm saying it was a really cool twist because I feel like the foreshadowing led you to a conclusion that's so close to what the conclusion actually is, but you didn't quite get it. I would be very surprised if somebody was able to predict that the Parshendi ended up being the Voidbringers themselves. I think that would be very hard to actually see, but once it was revealed, it makes perfect sense. And you're like, oh, wow. Now there's this possibility that the other Parshmen wake up, hear the music, if you will, and also become void bringers. Scary, <laughs> very scary. Certainly they're going to, they talk about the last desolation and the, you know, ever storm, all that jazz. So I'm sure something along those lines ends up happening, how prepared they are for it and how big a deal it ends up being. Not really sure. We shall see when we get there. Moving into some of the plot twists that we learned from Dalinar. I thought it was really obvious that Dalinar was going to end up uniting the Knights Radiant. I feel like I figured that out at like the halfway point. And so I feel like that could have been revealed a lot earlier. And that is my kind of my other big note. Like with a book this long, I think he could have taken some of these cool plot twists at the end and made them plot twists throughout. Because then it's just like these little like nuggets of like oh that was cool okay i want to keep reading because that was really neat and i want to know more about that but i guess that puts the pressure on him to actually do something with that information before the book ends so i can kind of see why like i said he had these questions that were the topic of this book which are what are the void bringers and where did they go and then who is dalinar trying to unite and how is he supposed to unite them what what's the deal with kaladin what's going to happen with him and so we got all those questions answered now we have these new questions of how are we going to protect ourselves against the void bringers how are we going to bring the knights radiant together and how are we going to train them and all the other stuff that we're about to talk about that's cool just again it's so long it's so long i just feel like interspersing some of these things could have made it easier to read but i i also understand why he kept them at the end so really that one's a toss-up do with that information what you will i did really really love his last vision with the almighty which is their god is what they call their god so that we're gonna spend a second here because there's so much here there's something here there's a little nugget here right here it's right here and we're, we're gonna dive in. Dalinar has been having these visions the whole time. They happen during the high storms. He thinks they might be from the Almighty, but he's not 100% sure. Maybe it's from somebody who's trying to trick him. And at one point, the Almighty tells him to trust Sidious. Or how I should word it, he asks if he can trust Sidious. And the Almighty is like, yes. And so he trusts Sidious and Sidious ends up betraying him at the battle. We've got this internal strife with Dalinar where he's like, not sure if it is the Almighty. And then is he trying to trick him? And then he's kind of like, I think it might be the Almighty. He trusts Sidious and that works out earlier in the book and then he trusts Sidious again and he ends up betraying him so now he's wondering is it really the almighty I've been talking to and can I trust him and that's a really fun dilemma for him to have only for him to have this vision at the end and realize the almighty has never been able to hear him and that what the almighty has said to him was set in stone the whole time he left those visions for anyone to find. Dalinar happened to be the one who found them and started having them, but the Almighty did not know who was gonna end up watching those visions when he left them behind, and it was not a call and response. It's not that Dalinar could talk to him and he would respond. Also, the Almighty is dead. That's what he says. He's like, I'm leaving these behind. I'm dead. Odium has killed me. So Odium is 
the devil? Well, we don't exactly know, but I have theories. And we'll get to those theories. But the Almighty is dead. He says that Odium killed him and that he left these visions behind for anybody to watch. That helps Dalinar kind of figure out he was never actually talking to the Almighty. Oh, oh, okay. What do we do with all that? That's so much. That's so, there's so much there. That's so cool. I think the message here is somewhat obvious, but it's still fun to talk about. And so I'm going to ramble about it a little bit. I thought it was really interesting that he showed a character that thought that the Almighty was talking directly to him, only to find out all of what Dalinar saw in how the Almighty was interacting with him was driven by Dalinar, not by the Almighty's actual actions. Anything else I want to say? Anything else? The Herald, okay, so right at the tail end, one of the Heralds returns and it seems as though he dies. I don't think he actually dies. I think we're gonna end up finding out that he survived. He just seemed dead. Some of the other questions we have, like where did the rest of the Heralds go? What has that Herald been through all this time? How can he guide the Knights Radiant? I imagine he'll end up going back to the war camp as well and helping with the Knights Radiant if he's still alive. If he's not still alive, obviously he's dead and so he won't be doing that. But I don't know, I didn't, the wit, the Wit stuff was kind of weird. I don't know who Wit is supposed to end up being. I guess we'll find out. I just thought he was a little too mysterious. I would like to know more about him at this point, but you gotta leave some questions unanswered for the next book, so is what it is. And the last note I have here is uh, say more advanced stuff about religion and men and death and the codes and heralds. Any thoughts, Mare, on what those advanced thoughts were gonna be? Good job. Good notes. I don't know. There's something there. There's something there and I haven't quite noodled on it enough yet. The religion and the way he talks about war and the way he talks about like humans destroying themselves. All these wars they had with the Voidbringers and the Voidbringers are really trying to drive the humans off the earth so that they can live there. Same as what they believe in this religion is that Odium and the Voidbringers drove everybody out of the Tranquiline Halls and onto Earth and that part of what people are training for in their time on Earth is to kind of join God's army when they die to fight to reclaim the Tranquiline Halls or Tranquiline Halls. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. These desolations are essentially this devil character possibly. Devil, I think, is too simplistic a way to put it. I think this is about balance. There was a point where one of the Ardents talked about balance and how it was like the pure goodness of the Almighty that almost created this pure evil. Like there had to be this balance. And so the same, you know, grand goodness that made the Almighty is the same grand evil that made this opponent to the Almighty, which we now know is named Odium. And then it seems that Odium has kind of won this battle. But what does it mean to kill a god? Is the Almighty really dead or is he just somewhere else and they have to go rescue him? He said he was dead, but is that just his understanding of the situation? What does that even mean? Is his soul just gone? It has to be somewhere, right? So is the Almighty going to come back? These are all questions that we have or that I have. I guess I don't know if you have those questions. What they say is that essentially Odium and the Voidbringers realized that the human beings were their own worst enemy. Actually fighting them kept every Everybody in line and that like all the humans were banded together against this common enemy to protect ourselves but that when left alone they started to kind of tear each other apart and so the Voidbringers then decided to leave the humans alone for a long time so that all these wars could rage on earth or Roshar is what they call it so that they could then come back and wipe all the humans out when they aren't united. And so that's the pressure that the Almighty has put on Dalinar is to unite all the humans and to get the Knights Radiant back together in order to defend against this final war against the Voidbringers when they come back because the Roshar is so split between all the kingdoms. Dalinar has already kind of come to the conclusion that the other high princes aren't living their lives super honorably. He believes in these codes that were written by this king, so it's not necessarily related to the Knights Radiant and the Almighty and the religion that they have. But the Knights Radiant do have almost their own codes. I forget what they call them, but that they also kind of live by. And a lot of it is based around the idea of living your life the best that you can. The Knights Radiant ones are the ones that are on the back of the book, which is like life before death. Shit, I forget. It's over there. I'm not going to grab it, but whatever. The whole idea of like living your life as honorably as you can. And it's about how you live your life and not the results 
that you get. So that's the Knight's Radiant Code. And then like the codes that this other king had written that Dalinar was really obsessed with are very similar, are essentially how to be honorable in war and how to always be prepared for anything. That with, like I said, the shard plate and the messaging we really got about what is your greatest strength also becoming your greatest weakness and how human beings, like I said, our sense of community and our ability to unite is our greatest strength because when we were united against the void bringers that's what helped us survive but then as time went on that strength is what became our weakness because we stopped seeing all of roshar and all the human beings as one force against something else and we started to see our individual communities as who we are defending against each other and that's what caused the war with each other that's i think the conclusion we were supposed to come to and i do think it was really well done and i feel like every storyline had a bit of that in it that all tied together at the end to create this really cool overarching message that strength can be weakness sometimes but that doesn't mean you can't turn it back into strength that it's about how you live your life and how honorably you live your life as opposed to the results of your life and how much riches you earn and how many countries you conquer and all of that yeah i don't know i thought it was cool i also forgot to mention but i thought it was hysterical when dalinar was beating the shit out of his nephew at the end of the book just for fun just came home and was like actually you need an ass beating and so i'm gonna give it to you i loved it i loved every second i'm very excited to see plot of the next book and how you know dalinar didn't really go for the throne but he wants to be the high prince of war and to have command over everybody's armies and that's gonna piss off all the other high princes and he's like i don't care this is the right thing to do and even here we see dalinar really living by his codes when it's the most difficult and offering sidious the only thing he could in order to free all the bridgemen because he swore that he would giving him the shard blade and then also giving away his shard plate to his son because he had promised it to him as well but then now he's taking over as a general overseeing everybody it's fascinating i'm really interested by it and kaladin i, I like still am just so like firm in my belief that kaladin is going to end up with sidious's shard plate and now shard blade so it's obviously going to end up back underneath dalinar but dalinar seems to be hanging up his helm he doesn't really want to go into battle anymore he wants to be more of a general and he's setting that up for the next book and part of him doing that was beating the shit out of his nephew the king which is just that's uh, sorry that's objectively funny and then walking out of the room and being like by the way i'm fucking your mom I mean, they haven't actually had sex yet, but still, it was like such a mic drop moment of like, I just beat the shit out of you and essentially demanded that you make me the High Prince of War. And as you're walking out of the room, also, I'm fucking your mom. Not blood related, by the way. Dal is he's his nephew because Dalinar... <laughs> Dalinar's brother's son not Dalinar's sister's son it's not an incest thing he's he's fucking his brother's widow okay not his sister let's be clear here they're not fucking yet they're not but I they gotta be they gotta at some point I'm gonna be really mad if it's a fade to black thing too have some balls Brandon write a sex scene I better see a full sex scene I'm gonna be so mad if it's like a fade to the ocean thing those are my thoughts, feelings, emotions. I'm sure I'll think of more. I'm sure I'll record inserts. I'm sure I'll record voiceovers. There was a lot to unpack. I tried to write it all down. We'll see if I nailed all of it or if I think of stuff later. This was a fun one. I appreciate it a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. I think I'll probably make more videos like this where I'm recapping the end of the next books. I don't think I'm going to keep doing where... I'm filming as I go. Let me know if you guys are interested in me talking about the later books or if you want me to just drop the series completely. It doesn't really align with a lot of the rest of what I read, so I'm not sure if many of my subscribers are even going to be interested in this book. But whatever. Have a great rest of the day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!